Inspector Gray's involvement in the affair was due to a combination of ill fortune and the photographic cover of a London urban legends paperback called The Secret Underground. He should not really have been in that part of London at the time, but had been forced to stay late in the office and complete a batch of grueling paperwork required by his superior the following morning. Had he driven past a matter of seconds before, he would have seen nothing. After all, he was off duty, and his main concern was to get back to his dingy flat in Tufnell Park, sink a few glasses of whisky, and forget about that day. He planned to lose himself in some cheap and trashy horror paperback from his little collection. The TV had broken down months ago, and instead of replacing it, he found that he had got into the habit of reading musty book relics from the sixties and seventies, with their yellowing, brittle pages and lurid covers. Gray fancied himself something of a connoisseur when it came to the covers. In fact, he felt himself in opposition with the old maxim about never judging a book by them. He harbored the conviction that those featuring a weird photographic composition were invariably superior to those that had artwork depicting the tired, cliché symbols of horror—skulls, snakes, or gothic castles, for example. In fact, he had come in for some jokes at his expense back at the yard over his choice of reading matter. Most of his colleagues talked about little except what they watched on TV the night before, often sleazy porn videos that they'd loaned from the Obscene Publications Division. They'd taken to calling him the weird detective behind his back, and on one occasion he'd turned around sharply to find a group of constables miming having vampire fangs by putting their index fingers at the corners of their mouths. Gray made sure thereafter that he wasn't seen reading any of his books during the little time he had for lunch. Instead, he read one of the broadsheet papers as he consumed his sandwiches at his desk. His alienation from his colleagues caused him pain, and he suspected that the department would run more smoothly were he not there. What Gray saw as he passed by in his car appeared to be some sort of stunted, emaciated creature peering through the trellis gates of Kentish Town Underground Station. The thing was only around four or five feet tall and dressed in black ragged overalls. Its face was obscured by a mass of dusty, shoulder-length hair. It was gone 1 a.m. when Gray passed the underground station, and it had been closed for only a short time. He had pulled over to the side of the road and looked back in order to see whether the apparition was still there, but there was no sign of it at all. Doubtless, he thought, his colleagues back at the yard would have laughed at what he thought he saw too many of those damn books he read. But Gray felt his heart racing in his chest. He could not dismiss the thing that easily from his mind. What he'd seen was no product of the imagination. It had really been there. Although the station was closed, it might not yet be deserted. Once the train service finished, there were still staff working on the platforms and in the tunnels. An army of cleaners called fluffers made their way along the lines and scoured them for debris. All manner of litter had to be cleared away, beer cans, half-eaten junk food, newspapers, even tumbleweeds composed of skin and human hair. There was also the gangers, the engineers who checked track safety. Perhaps Gray had simply glimpsed one of those overnight workers having a break one whose similarity to the uncanny thing on the front cover of The Secret Underground was nothing more than a trick of the light. Nevertheless, what he had observed remained in his thoughts, causing uneasy dreams when he finally slept. Dreams of endless subterranean tunnels, and of a gaunt silence punctuated by a distant rustling or whispering noise. Had he not seen whatever it was at the station, or whatever he thought it was, the case that came to his attention afterwards might not have seemed significant and worth pursuit. 
as he sat at his desk the next morning, sipping at a cup of vile instant coffee, Gray flicked through the case files in his inbox. He had a feeling that it had become increasingly commonplace during the course of the last few months. It was that the investigations to which he had been assigned were effectively a waste of effort. The assault that he'd suffered months ago during the arrest of Montrose, the serial rapist, had left him hospitalized for weeks and resulted in internal ruptures that would, he had been advised by the surgeon, require a much more sedate lifestyle. The yard had done the best they could under the circumstances and found him a role, albeit desk-bound. But although his initial assignments had been current, Gray discovered that, as time passed, he was being asked to examine cases that had little chance of being solved. The bulk of these were missing persons. Scarcely sociable before, Gray had turned further inwards after the beating. It had affected his mind just as much as his body. Somehow, he had allowed his old friends to drift away and found excuses not to keep in touch with them. He felt himself to be little more than an empty shell, and contact with others only served to reinforce the impression. The yard offered Gray counseling to help him come to terms with the trauma caused by the Montrose incident, but he found the idea even more repellent than his doctor's suggestion that he take a course of antidepressants. When fate worked upon him, he intended to adapt to it and not resist. Even so, he felt like a missing person who had himself been assigned to trace other missing persons. Gray ran his tongue over his scalded lips, again cursing the too hot and foul-tasting coffee, when his attention was taken up by a communique that had come in only a few hours earlier. Although a missing persons report is not usually filed until some days after a disappearance, except where children are involved, this one had been fast-tracked due to there being no question of the subject having absented himself deliberately. The missing individual was a tube-trained driver, or operator, as they were now called. His name was Adam Drayton. The curious thing was this— he had abandoned his train between the Camden Town and Kentish Town stations on the Northern Line. It had been the very last service of the night due to terminate at High Barnet at 1.30 a.m. Moreover, if there had been any passengers in the carriages, then they too had vanished. Early in the morning a replacement driver had shunted the train into a siding. On the front of the case file a joker in the office had scrawled the words, Mary Celeste Tube, a case for the weird detective with a marker pen. But Inspector Gray, through some bizarre coincidence, was one of the few people who would recognize the name Adam Drayton in another connection. For it was also the name of the author, editor, of that outre book of urban legends published under the title The Secret Underground, whose cover preyed upon his mind. Gray spent the afternoon interviewing Drayton's colleagues in the staff mess room of the train depot just outside Finchley Central Station. This was where the tube drivers spent their time between shifts, sitting around drinking coffee, smoking their cigarettes, and reading newspapers. They were a talkative bunch, although the inspector could not help noticing their mistrust and fear of him as a representative from an outside authority. Some of them even seemed to believe that Drayton's disappearance was an internal matter and should be left to the Union to investigate. Outside interference, whether from the law or elsewhere, was certainly not welcome. Still, there were one or two who retained a sense of individuality and were able to realize that Gray had not come in order to apportion any blame, merely to discover what may have led Drayton to act in the manner that he did. One of the drivers, Carlos Miguel, a Castilian, was particularly communicative. He had settled in this country after leaving Madrid in the early 1990s. He had been almost alone in befriending Drayton, who had been regarded by the others as an oddball whose political views were not sufficiently radical. Miguel was a tall, 
distinguished man in his forties with a shock of jet-black hair and a neatly trimmed mustache. He had shared Drayton's enthusiasm for the recondite, and whilst the others talked of union activities or the football results, the two men had retreated to a corner and held their own discussions. Had Gray not been aware of Drayton's editorship of that paperback, The Secret Underground, he doubted that he would have achieved quite the same rapport with Carlos Miguel. So, the Spaniard declared, you know of El Libro de Drayton? Yes, Gray replied. I think it's a bit garish, but the cover is particularly Miguel cut in. Senor, you know that Drayton only applied to become a train operator so that he could travel the tunnels of the Northern Line and examine their mysteries? Gray looked blank and shook his head. Well, Miguel went on, you must understand that it would not be mistaken to say that he was obsessed with them. Drayton told me that the Northern Line has the longest continuous Yerkes tunnel on the network, over seventeen miles long. The stretch between East Finchley and Morden. Also, it has the deepest, at Hampstead, nine hundred feet below ground. He had numerous theories about what was down there. Fantastical, no? Speculations, rumor, hearsay, Gray responded, amounting to nothing more than fiction. He was just an editor of a horrible series of urban legends. I confess that the parallel between his disappearance and obsession is striking, but— Perdón, señor, but it is more than that simple fact. Drayton was my friend. It was in me that he felt he could confide. Las estaciones fantasmas. You know them? In English, the ghost stations, North End City Road, South Kentish Town, and King William Street? These were what obsessed Drayton. The abandoned stations? See, si, abandoned. Pero in Drayton's eyes, no? Taken over, he would have replied, no longer safe to use, senor. If you are operating the last train on the line, it is easier to slow down when you wish, no? Perhaps while traveling through one of those stations, and even bringing trains to a complete stop, there are not so many passengers, and they are too drunk or sleepy to complain at that time of night. To comprendes? Are you suggesting that Adam Drayton stopped his train and got out at one of these ghost stations? Como una paramia atraída por la llama. I don't understand. Like a moth drawn to a flame. That evening, once Gray had got back to his cramped flat in Tufnell Park, he sat down in his easy chair with his copy of The Secret Underground. He flicked back and forth through its yellowed, brittle pages, glancing at them over and over again. And the book was divided into several chapters, each specializing in a subterranean urban legend. 1. Cases of Posthumous Mutation in London Cemeteries 2. Derelict Reverse Skyscrapers, 1936-57 3. Mass Disappearance of Persons Sheltering in the Underground During the Blitz 4. Graffiti or Occult Symbolism 5. Suppressed Eyewitness Accounts During the Construction of the Underground Railways, 1860-1976 6. The Fleet Line Extension to Fenchurch Street must be halted. 7. Secret bunkers or extermination centers. 8. The deep-level platforms of the proposed express tube, why they caused insanity. 9. The hidden shafts that connect subterranean London. There was one paragraph in the final chapter that seemed to be the inspiration for the uneasy dreams Gray had experienced. It ran as follows. Most of the city is now underground, and not above the surface. And I scarcely need list its innumerable tunnels, subterranean car parks, cellars, crypts, bunkers, basements, vaults, passageways, and sewers. 
Every building in London has an underside buried deep in the earth. Beneath our feet are the ruins of Anglo-Saxon Lundenwick and of Roman Londinium. The contemporary city will in time be swallowed up. This neon and concrete labyrinth will become an Atlantis of catacombs. The higher we build up, the deeper it is necessary to build down in order to support the structures above. All the nightmare sewage that we pump into the depths, all the foulness and corruption, the abortions, the feces and scum, the blood and diseased mucus, but mostly the hair. What a feast for those underground beings that exist in darkness and shun the sunlight. Those things below hate us and have every reason to do so. His attention kept jumping from the text to the series of bizarre black-and-white photographs throughout the book. Quite where Drayton had obtained them from was not made clear. They were not credited. They may even have come from his personal collection. What they showed was this. Front cover, a blurred humanoid figure seen from a passing tube train whose face is almost completely covered by its hair. Between the strands, there seems to be a mouth lined with shark-like fangs. The haggard creature is backing into a siding away from the light. Page 18, a photographic record of a series of exhumed graves with empty coffins whose bases had been torn apart. Page 33, a blueprint of a subterranean reverse tower with forty-five stories and access shafts radiating from it in all directions. Some leading to burial grounds, others to sewers, etc., bearing the legend, North End, Hampstead. Page 49. What appears to be a series of bloody smeared handprints on the white wall tiles of British Museum Station during its use as an air raid shelter, circa 1941. Page 87. Human bones, including a skull, photographed lying alongside the tracks of an underground tunnel. Page 102. Graffiti scrawled in charcoal. On the side of 1972 MK1 train stock that reads, The hungry cannot sleep. We crawl through graves. The darkness behind your eyes. And below there is only pain. Page 126, a sewer chamber choked by vast quantities of hair hanging from a curved ceiling of Victorian brickwork. It was relatively easy for Gray to obtain a search warrant in order to enter the disused South Kentish Town Station. Although above ground, the building was now occupied by a massage parlor where once the ticket hall had been, all the subterranean shafts, corridors, and other passageways were still owned by London Underground. Since their abandonment, there had been no reason to maintain them, and parts of the former station were unsafe. In order to gain access, Gray had to agree to be accompanied by a track maintenance engineer who worked on that stretch of the northern line and who was familiar with the site. This engineer, John Heath, arranged to meet Gray outside the massage parlor at the corner of Kentish Town Road and Castle Place. The inspector parked his car directly in front of the building and was struck by the fact that its exterior still had the appearance of an underground station, lacking only the familiar sign displayed outside. Hanging around in front of the entrance to the newsagents was a small man in a yellow safety helmet and boiler suit. He carried a heavy bag with a subcontractor's logo on it. His hands were entirely covered with a thick layer of soot. Doubtless, it was the man who had been assigned to assist Gray. Heath looked just like a throwback to the 1960s. His hippie-length hair was brittle and gray as dust. Over his mouth and nose, he wore a loose protective mask. He also wore a pair of John Lennon-style glasses with thick lenses, that made the eyes behind them look liquid. He was really quite horribly ridiculous. After Gray had produced his police ID, the two went inside 
and the inspector explained their purpose to the owners of the massage parlor, who seemed relieved that the search was not connected with what went on at their premises. Then Heath, consulting a map of the structure, led Gray down into a storage cellar at the back of the establishment, where access to the emergency stairs could be gained. The old lift shafts were useless. Their cages and all the workings had been removed back when the station was closed in 1924. But the stairway to the upper lift landing and the emergency staircase to the lower lift landing were passable. The entry doors were padlocked, and Heath sought and tried several keys drawn from his bag before he found the correct ones to use. May, Heath said, his voice muffled by the baggy mask covering his mouth and nose, told me why you want to get down here. Anyway, it's pointless. We already looked for Drayton. All you're doing is putting yourself in danger. I'll be the judge of that, replied Gray. Just get on with it. You do your job and I'll do mine, okay? Watch your step as we go. These old passageways are treacherous. Even if you don't wind up falling into a ventilation shaft, you might stumble in front of a passing train. Hear the noise? As he unlocked the door, there came from far below in the depths the sound of carriages rumbling along distant tracks, followed moments later by a powerful draft of musty air. Heath chuckled. He turned on a powerful torch and aimed its beam along the stairway and around to the dark green tiled walls at the turn ahead. The steps were littered with debris. Gray was amazed at how familiar and yet how strange their surroundings appeared. Like any Londoner, he had used the tube system on innumerable occasions, and had passed through the subterranean mazes of many stations, though always when they were illuminated by overhead strip lighting, with hurried passengers making their way to or from a platform. But here the darkness was in control and every echoing footfall reinforced the grim feeling of total isolation. And yet it was only the withdrawal of light and of other people that created this feeling. Actually, it was just the same as any other tube station would be after the services had stopped running. Except that this was no temporary interruption to be resumed in the morning. This really was what Carlos Miguel called una estación Fantasma. Did you know Adam Drayton? Gray asked in order to break the gaunt silence between the sound of passing trains. He could only see the back of Heath. The engineer's slightly hunched form crept downwards along the steps, apparently intent solely upon what he was doing, but he finally responded after what seemed to be a considered pause. Oh, yes, he said. I knew of him, all right. He was legendary on the northern line, kept stopping his train at odd places and holding up the services. Only worked at night when it didn't matter so much. The union stepped in to stop him getting the sack, said he was worried about safety. Safety? The union said it was faulty signals that were to blame and strange noises on the track made him cautious. Better to be safe than sorry. Go slow is preferable to taking chances. That's what the Union said. They had reached the bottom of the stairway and emerged onto the upper lift landing. The tiles here were a grimy cream and red color. In the circle of light cast by Heath's torch, he caught glimpses of advertising posters from the early 1920s that had been left up on the tiled walls of the corridor ahead. Life Boy, Bovril, Oxo, Wrigley's, and Guinness. Another tube train roared through one of the tunnels below, and the accompanying blast of air flapped the torn parts of the posters. What do you know about the disused stations here on the northern line? Have you seen the others for yourself? Gray asked. I know something. I've been in them all at one time or another. They have a bad reputation. The most significant is North End, or the Bull and Bush, as the train operators like to call it, Heath responded, 
Why significant? The floodgates, you know, said Heath. Instead of the tube station that was going to be there in 1906, they developed it into a central command center. Certain stations on the network have the gates, but they're all controlled from North End. Reckon the building goes down more than a thousand feet, though only the higher levels were initially used. It was started in the 1940s, so they could stop the entire underground system being flooded. Most of the gates were individually controlled before then. How could the whole system be flooded? If the Nazis had dropped a bomb in the Thames, the tunnels under the river could have collapsed. Within ten minutes, the underground system would have been completely filled with water and submerged, you know. Well, that's what they said. Later on, in the early 1970s, they built a second zone of gates just outside stations like Shepherd's Bush, Old Get East, and Bounds Green, before where the tracks emerge over ground. What have they got to do with flooding? Nothing. But they thought people would go mental when the three-minute warnings went off and try to run along the tracks into the train tunnels to escape from Soviet atom bombs. Well, you get the idea. By now they'd reached the emergency spiral stairway, which led much further downward to the lower lift landing. It was considerably steeper than the previous stairway, and Gray kept a hand against the wall, as the two men descended. Their footfalls echoed as if ghosts were following close behind. Talking of weird stuff like that, you know about the Sentinel train? Heath asked. He didn't wait for an answer before continuing with his topic. First stop, King William Street Station, along the abandoned spur. Runs down to Burrow without halting. Then reverses up the bank branch of the northern line. Only stops at the ghost stations along the route. Nowhere else. Goes on to City Road right here to South Kentish Town, then back via Camden before terminating at the deepest of all. North End, under Hampstead Heath. Anyway, I told you about that one, didn't I? The Sentinel lets the inspection crews examine the stuff the public never sees. Company doesn't leave the traction current to the rails on overnight. So a diesel locomotive pulls the old F-stock carriages. The train has a free run on the deserted tracks. Happens once a week or thereabouts. Every tube line has its own sentinel. Are you pulling my leg? Gray replied testily. That's straight out of Drayton's book. It seems to me you must have read it. They'd reached the lower lift landing. This passageway leads to the north and southbound platforms, he said, but they're long gone. With the idea not totally ridiculous, Gray could have mistaken his companion for something dressed up in a boiler suit in order to pass as human. His colleagues at the yard would have laughed at his suspicion, but he could not shake off the impression that, in the darkness, Heath's appearance was genuinely similar to the figure that Gray had glimpsed peering out of the trellised gates of Kentish Town Station. That was only a few nights ago, and one stop along the northern line from this ghost station. He'd seen it with his own eyes, and the experience was not drawn from the pages of a crazy book like The Secret Underground. Gray could easily believe that this character, Heath, had not just read the volume, but had stepped out from its pages into life. You didn't answer my question, Gray said. From his coat pocket he drew a packet of Benson and Hedges cigarettes. What one was that again? He snuffled. The one about having read The Secret Underground. Gray responded as he jammed one of the smokes between his lips and touched the end with the flame from a battered old Zippo. A faint smell of petrol wafted from the lighter. He drew on the cigarette and exhaled sending curling blue smoke across the beam of Heath's torch. Oh, that, look, you can't smoke down here. It's dangerous. Do you see any no-smoking signs around? Anyway, I'm sure your mask will protect you. Heath paused and regarded the glowing tip of Gray's cigarette. He finally came back to the point. Yeah, I've read that book. I know it off by heart. It's a favorite of mine. 
From further back along the passageways, Gray thought he detected a rustling noise, like a pile of leaves dispersed by the wind. But before he was able to tell from which direction it came, the racket of a passing northbound train drowned them out. Gray thought he heard Heath muttering. It sounded like Big Mouth Miguel, he sorted. But most of these words were also lost in the roar. It was obvious that Heath knew something about Drayton's disappearance, and may even have had a hand in it. Perhaps he was also dangerously obsessed with all those ghost stations, and had come to regard Drayton as his rival. In any case, the place to interview Heath was back at the yard, not here and now. Gray's back and stomach ached. The old ruptures were playing up again. It was time to get back to the surface. There was nothing down here that was of any use to his investigation. Besides, although Heath was small, Gray feared that he was dealing with a lunatic. There was that damn rustling again like leaves. It sounded closer this time. Heath seemed not to notice it, though, and coldly regarded Gray, smoking his cigarette, glaring through narrowed eyes that swam behind the thick lenses of his glasses. Well, said Gray, I've seen everything I want to see here. Let's get back to the surface. All right, Heath replied. But you ain't looked yet. To come all this way and not look at it would be a waste of my time and yours. Look at what, exactly? Over there in the corner, thirty yards right up against the wall, Heath flashed the torch's beam onto what appeared to be a large pile of rags. Go and see. I already know what it is. I'll stay where I am, in case you're worried like. As he got nearer, Gray glanced back to make sure that Heath made no attempt to creep up on him. What he believed was a pile of rags was in fact a body slumped in the angle between wall and floor, its face turned towards the tiles. The back of its skull was smashed in. Dried blood caked the matted hair. As he turned the body over, Gray guessed that its face would be unfamiliar. He expected it to be Drayton, whom he'd never seen but it was the Spaniard, Carlos Miguel. Heath had not moved an inch whilst Gray examined the corpse, but something living dropped from the darkness of the ceiling onto him, and the impact drove the police inspector crashing to the floor. His head struck the concrete, and he blocked out. Gray awoke in a tube-train carriage. He felt nauseous with pain as consciousness returned. He ran his fingers over his head and found half a dozen scratches and wounds around his face and on the back of his skull. There was a stabbing pain in his stomach, and he was aware of feeling wet around the seat of his trousers. The fall had reopened some of his old internal ruptures, and blood was leaking out of his lower intestine. Although racked with pain, he forced himself to take in the details of his surroundings. He was on a moving train, one that hurtled through the tunnels at breakneck speed. The floor was littered with prostrate bodies. Some were hanging by their necks from knotted leather straps attached to the ceiling rails. All had been recently murdered and bore signs of mutilation. There were dozens of the corpses packed into the carriage. Their limbs protruded at misshapen angles from the humps of flesh and clothing. Extreme terror and pain marked their facial expressions. The body of Carlos Miguel lay amongst the charnel crowds. Like the Castilian, Gray had been left for dead. Somehow he'd come to be a passenger in a carriage that appeared to date from, he guessed, the 1920s. The carriage lights were single bulbs housed in Art Deco glass oysters, with a very wide aisle running between the longitudinal seating. It must have been antiquated rolling stock, for there were advertisements from that far-off decade above the windows, and the underground map showed routes such as the Hampstead and Highgate Line, the City and South London Railway, and the Central London Railway. Back then, the Victoria and Jubilee Lines had not even been thought of, let alone built. Moreover, the map was like a complicated tangle of spaghetti, and not modeled on the famous Beck circuit board design. Struggling to his feet and clutching the pole at the end of the seats, Gray stood in a daze for a moment, 
rocking with the motion of the train. His wristwatch showed 1.20 a.m. He'd been out cold for well over eight hours. His left trouser leg stuck to the inside of his thigh, where the stream of blood oozing from his rectum had partially dried. He picked his way through the corpses and found that he was trapped in the last carriage of the train, and the connecting door to the penultimate carriage had been welded shut. Gray crept back to a seat and peered through the window to the tunnels outside. Suddenly the train entered a platform without slowing, and he pressed his face to the glass in order to try and make out the station name as it flashed past. The light from the interior of the carriages projected enough illumination for him to see a faded sign reading North End. It also just made visible the stunted, faceless forms that haunted the shadows of passageways further back, forms that shunned the light but which welcomed the arrival of the sentinel with malefic glee, chattering deafeningly in the semi-darkness. Gray had no doubt that the inner and outer gates were closed right the way across the underground network, now that the sentinel had completed its journey. He harbored the notion that these gates served a purpose quite different from the official one and were used to prevent escape along the tracks to the surface. Drayton had described many pieces of the jigsaw in his book The Secret Underground. Gray had not fitted them together until it was too late and would finally solve the mystery in the labyrinthine reaches of an industrial sheol. In his mind's eye, he saw a vision in which the disparate chapters of Drayton's book merged to form a coherent explanation of what was happening. It was an explanation involving a series of derelict reverse skyscrapers, one of which was beneath North End, whose ultimate depth was probably over a thousand feet, a structure populated by beings who were sometimes bored with the repast foraged by using the smaller tunnels that led to the cemeteries and burial grounds across London. Could it be possible that the feasters had absorbed some of the characteristics of the corpses upon which they preyed, as in cannibalistic folklore? He thought of an abandoned train and its driver, Como una palomilla, of a man called Heath with thick eyeglasses, his face obscured, and who knew as much as Drayton himself. As he thought about the ghost stations on the Piccadilly line, the Central line, the Metropolitan line, and all the others, he guessed that each doubtless had its own sentinel operating that night as well. Suddenly the lights in all the carriages went out. Acting on the signal as they'd done so many times in the past, they surged up from the edifice's black abyss of corridors and debris-choked rooms in a ravenous tide. As the stunted forms eagerly scrambled across the divide between them and the train, he finally realized that, in order to keep them down there in the dark, to prevent them overrunning London altogether, it was necessary for them to be fed. Gray only had time to scream once in the darkness.